I would like to ask uh, Miss Hartley that is there any NGOs promoting this kind of renewable energy in South Africa? Any NGOs promoting uh, and have they been instrumental in this kind of change also? Like Green ID in Vietnam? Yes. May I collect uh, some more questions before we come to answer? Please. Hello, uh, my name is Eugenia Valenzinia from Lop Penrand University of Technology. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for really interesting presentations. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting to see how things are happening in, in such countries like South Africa or Vietnam. And uh, I see that there, there is a struggle as, as like in Europe and like everywhere else that we have conventional type of power production. And of course you have to like, not have to, but I mean, of course it's a wise thing to trans, um, to go through transition towards renewables. And what, what and I, this question to all panelists, I think, uh, what do you think would be the most efficient way to do this transition in less painful less co not costly let's say less painful for the consumer way and also a uh, second question is about developing countries and uh, going to like um, considering uh, population growth and considering the fact that more than 1 billion people right now live without electricity at all uh, do you think it's wise to actually construct the huge, large uh, renewable power plants or sh would it be better to go for decentralized, smaller scale uh, type of using local uh, resources, uh, power production? And also um, the third question, this is very small wall for Douglas uh, on this modeling. I see that this was made for 2026, right? And it's it shows uh, what's what's the production from different types of um, energy sources. And I see a lot of coal, like in PGM market. And it's just like I, I'm so surprised because I would assume it would be gas because gas is less pollutant. And uh, I see coal. And what's what's the answer to that? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Maybe the third question, please. Um, my question is, is that. Thank you. So my my question is the the role of hydro. Sometimes hydro is included as renewable. Sometimes it's not. Um, and then the question is, uh, with all the the other externalities with with hydro of reservoirs and environmental impacts, how do you see them? going on and then the other issue is um, when we look at them in some of the work which we'll hear about tomorrow this is a shameless plug for the session tomorrow on climate change we can see in the zambezi basin dropping by 2070 like 40 to 50 percent of the generation how do we look at um, that in terms of your hydro with the climate change impact so there is a feedback how do we bring them into our tools Thank you very much. May I uh, ask, uh, maybe, uh, Douglas, do you want to take the floor of uh, the question at first? Um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and I'll do the reverse order of questions, I guess. Okay. So I'll, I'll start with the hydro and then answer the question on the coal. Uh, and then I'll, I'll make a few comments on transition pathways, but then we can um, flush that out as a panelist. Um, so hydro... Large hydro is typically recognized as a, as a clean renewable source, and but also separated from the variable generating sources. So that's also the same for biomass, uh, if it's in biomass power, um, it, which is also separating. So these tend to be by ability to um, manage flexibly or to be dispatched. Um, so it's really more the characteristic of the type of power. Uh, your point on the example from the Zambezi Basin, which is also the same 
phenomena which is happening in Brazil on large hydro and the, the impact of climate change on precipitation, on hydro generating capability, I think is a general point, which is really important, which is that not only in the energy system modeling and analysis, et cetera, for economics of the energy system, but broadly for economic modeling, I mean, across the economy, I think that all modeling has to begin to be much more rigorous about incorporating climate futures in that tooling kit. Uh, because we know from IPCC work uh, that you know the impacts are already built are already built into the system and actually are already being felt. Adaptation will accommodate some of that, but not all of it, and that there will be very heterogeneous changes uh, depending upon the location, the economic uh, structure of the economy, et cetera. So beyond energy, which it does need to be accounted for, it needs to be accounted for in the, in the economic modeling as well. On the coal versus gas, just a PJM, it's a very small point on the PJM piece. Yes, it's not very far out, and so um, that um, did not incorporate any um, significant change uh, in the thermal power pleat, except for those changes which were announced already. Uh, this is now two years ago. Um, so there wasn't anything more than that. And it was a very moderate scenario for PJM. It was about a 30% total renewable generation. Those scenarios are set by large steering committees of stakeholders. Um, so that, that's why there's still coal and gas in there as well. But there's not a large capital stock shift in the next uh, projected in the next eight years of coal for gas so i'll stop there i've got some other comments that i can make on the transition piece but um maybe after my colleagues comment thank you may i ask miss uh, hungu uh, okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, yeah, all the questions. Uh, I just uh, would like to, uh, again, uh, go uh, firstly with uh, the hydropower development uh, uh, and just uh, focusing on the, uh, the Vietnam case. And uh, then I, uh, I I will answer to your questions uh, relating to the, uh, the, the best way uh, to tran uh, uh, transition from the renew uh, renew uh, non-renewable en energy to the renewable uh, energy path. And also about the uh, the, the way uh, to decentralize the kind of the transition uh, to the local uh, resource and so on. Um, first about the hydropower. Um, actually, Vietnam have very heavily uh, depend on the hydropower development uh, in the past years, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the experience uh, shows that a lot of the environmental impact. Uh, Cause uh, from this uh, development, and uh, nowadays a lot of uh, the uh, issue and also the uh, circumstances which make the policymaker to think about the whether they continue to develop uh, new hydropower development uh, projects, and uh, also about uh, uh, reconsidering the transition with uh, another uh, kind of the power. Uh, um, firstly, uh, it's because uh, you know that uh, the, there are several research uh, showing that continuing uh, to, uh, uh, to develop the hydropower uh, would uh, create a serious uh, environmental uh, issue relating to uh, the this, uh, deforestation uh, in the area where the hydropower dams was built. And it uh, make uh, a serious impact uh, to the local uh, community. The second thing is uh, based on the research by, um, uh, by, by uh, the uh, Energy Institute in Vietnam, it showed that the potential for hydropower development in Vietnam now already about to observe. I mean, the, we, we already can, um, uh, consume all, almost all the, uh, the potential of the hydropower development. So that's a, one of the reasons for Vietnam now should think about to, 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 uh, to the new way uh, to uh, increase our uh, elect uh, electricity capacity. Ele uh, 
uh, energy development capacity. So uh, that's uh, the um, that's why in uh, the slide I show with you that um, uh, the share of the hydropower um, in in the, uh, the the energy sector uh, structure has been declined has declined by 2030s. Uh, meanwhile, the non-renewable energy, like uh, I said before, the coal fire, uh, just 30, uh, 40, uh, 42%. Um, and uh, renewable energy, like the wind, solar, and so on, increased uh, dramatically. So that's with the uh, hydropower. Uh, the, the second uh, uh, question relates to the, the way uh, less uh, painful. Um, actually, uh, we cannot say about uh, talk about the any any way to the 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 way to fit or to all countries. I think, uh, but in the case of Vietnam, uh, we uh, we already see that uh, to to move from current situation to the renewable energy would. Uh, uh, give more opportunities, particularly with the uh, the, peop uh, the people, the poor people in the mountainous area, and also uh, the community. Uh, the because uh, in Vietnam, we we, we uh, the company they they cannot <coughs> directly provide electricity to uh, to the the people uh, to the household or to the company without connecting to the national grid system. So it means that every renewable energy, when they um, kind of invest, they have to, uh, to sell their uh, elect electricity uh, production to the EVN, the, uh, the state-owned company, which, uh, um, which is in charge in, uh, in, in buying the electricity and distribute and then retail. Uh, to the user, uh, to, to the customers. So um, uh, the the <coughs> I can see that when we uh, we uh, when the ten, uh, the tendency of the price decrease of the renewable energy will give the opportunity for Vietnam to move from the uh, the the cost. Actually, if as uh, Dr. Zhuang uh, said. If we include all the environmental costs and other social costs of the hydropower, uh, of the um, uh, coal fine uh, plant uh, development to into the cost, it could be much, much higher uh, than as it was now. Uh, and uh, then renewable energy uh, development become more competitive. And the third, uh, and that relate to the the another uh, another uh, question about the how the developing country can move uh, the to this uh, uh, this path uh, whether we can decentralize um, and use the local resources to uh, for for the renewable energy development I think that there are two two things the third one is um, kind of a technological capacity improvement of the country like the uh, like Vietnam uh, so that make sure that uh, we can uh, we can uh, develop our uh, kind of the uh, the uh, we we can uh, adopt, uh, adopt the technolo uh, technological advance and uh, and can be able to produce the domestic uh, product relating to the uh, the renewable energy like uh, solar uh, uh, I think I think uh, uh, just uh, like the solar panel uh, to in 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 uh, in, uh, in the company uh, they can use that and then sell it uh, uh, with a lower price and also even in Vietnam now uh, so there are some private company they um, well they 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 produce uh, the kind of the heating. Uh, Heating equipment, but use the solar energy uh, in in the uh, in the building. So that's a, that. This is a kind of decentralized um, uh, and also the the, the internalized 
uh, the technology uh, that could uh, provide the opportunity for the pe the poor people for the, uh, the the more community can access and can be can use uh, with the uh, the new renewable uh, energy so that's my thought about that. thank you thank you Farka okay yeah, so um I'll start at the start um so in terms of NGOs promoting clean energy in South Africa yes uh, there are a number of NGOs um, including WWF Clean Cape and there are so many others um, and I think they've not only been promoting green energy but they've been promoting um, trying to reduce emissions um, and a reduction in emissions is part of government's plan. Um, so we've got the Department of Environmental Affairs that have very specific, or trying to put in very specific targets in terms of how to go about reducing mitigation, um, reducing emissions, putting in place various mitigation plans. Um, we've got the carbon tax, for example, that has been um, implemented or rather legislated by the National Treasury. Um, but I think that the issue that you find within South Africa is that there's still um, a lot of um, uncoordination, perhaps is the correct word, between these various departments. So you'll have the Department of Environmental Affairs, which is um, uh, trying to put in place uh, policies to reduce emissions, um, but then you have the Department of Energy that's still very much focusing on coal. Um, so these are contradicting, contradicting one another. Um, and so while this is the case, um, I do think that it's getting better. And there does seem to be uh, more of a general acceptance um, of the potential that renewable energy holds for South Africa. So not just in terms of lowering the electricity price, um, but also in the sense of what it can mean for manufacturing and that it can provide this new um, sort of set of industries um, that can help um, in terms of employment as well as, as, as growth. Um, on the centralized versus decentralized um, uh, RE plans, um, so that's highly dependent on the country and sort of the geographical locations of peoples and businesses and, and what, what infrastructure is in place. Um, so in the case of South Africa, uh, we've got a very good network um, or transmission network in place. So um, there isn't actually the need that much for decentralized. And over the years, we have been trying to include, um, so increase or uh, there has been an increase in um, energy uh, access uh, for people in the country. Um, but that being said, there is a trend um, in terms of decentralization, both by commerce as well as residents, um, or what's more your wealthy residents. So what you've actually seen is that um, a lot of businesses and residential households have um, included rooftop PV um, in their buildings. And it's, it's, it's a cost, it's a cost, um, it's based on a cost decision where the prices of um, solar PV panels, for example, have come down to the extent where people are saying, well, if I make this investment now, I'll recoup my money in 10 to 15 years, whereas I'm less certain about what's going to be happening at ESCOM and with the the national electricity price. Um, so that uh, that is something um, that is taking place. and. While it's a cost decision, I think it's also a little bit about uh, consumer consciousness as well, because um, uh, you find that in many sort of, uh, there the is a beginning, a, a trend that's starting in terms of, you know, lowering the footprint um, and trying to be more, more efficient. Um, in terms of the most efficient way um, uh, or the most efficient manner to do the transition. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Um, I mean, the one thing to do is that in the case of electricity and energy planning, we should try um, to do least cost options as far as possible because that will ensure that the price increases we see in the economy are, are low. Um, and I think also um, there should be there should be a change in mentality where we're not trying to protect industries that are not viable or that are not sustain sustainable. Um, so that is something uh, or uh, factors that need to be considered. But then at the same time, we also need to think about these people that are going to be affected. Um, in the case of South Africa, um, in the power sector um, and sort of shifting 
towards green, green energy, um, this is actually the perfect time for us to do that because we've got a lot of our coal power stations are quite old and they sort of coming towards the end of lifespan. Um, by 2040, we'll have basically only two coal power stations that will still be operating within their lifespan. We've also got nuclear, uh, nuclear power stations also uh, reaching the end of life. So we do need to make decisions about what we are going to be investing in. Um, and given that we do need to spend the money in the electricity sector, um, we can do it in a way that's one cheaper um, and then also two uh, better uh, for the country in terms of, of mitigation um, emissions. Thanks. Thank you. Can we uh, offer, Douglas? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll offer a couple of comments on the pathways uh, question. Um, so there's a paper that uh, myself and colleagues wrote a couple of years ago at Zinneman and all on power systems of the future that, that would be useful here to reflect on. And so um, there are a couple of principles, I think, to take into account. One is, what's the starting point? It's a very different conversation about pathway and transition for an OECD country uh, versus a, a, an emerging economy. Um, and so that's the first point. And then for some of those that have developed energy system and particularly a power system, there are a couple of options to be thinking about. Much as if there's a, I'll call it a development paradigm from an economics perspective, there is also a set of development paradigms for the transition for power systems in particular. One is around uh, generally called clean restructuring, which is essentially going from a vertically integrated, wholly owned organization, it could be parastatally owned, it could be private, and breaking it apart into an independent operator, an independent regulator, and in, uh, promoting, uh, frankly, liberalization and competition in generation and also in retail services. So very much of an economic paradigm of moving forward in, in how that works. And then in also promoting then energy services uh, much like is happening through much of, well, some of Europe and much of the United States and a few other countries where, again, broader and deeper markets for more competition and more healthy economics going forward. That's one approach. The other approach is more of, I'll call it a regulatory approach because power systems tend to be natural monopolies and they tend to be oriented toward, um, I'll call it traditional regulation. And in that case, the, the predominant paradigm toward transition toward clean energies is, is oriented toward performance-based regulation. This is, this is slightly different than what's happened in the last 15 years, which has been an approach what, that I would call has two main components of it. One is a quantitative goal. So this is a renewable portfolio standard or a renewable um, generation target. That is separated from financial mechanisms and fiscal mechanisms that could be tax credits, uh, could be feed-in tariffs, could be all these other elements which are more on the finance side. That's They're there to support the quantitative goals. And they might be in parallel with carbon trading, renewable energy credit trading, all sorts of other, again, policy instruments across the economy or across some sector of the economy. So those are the two main elements depending on where you start. The other thing which I think is really important, and it's, it's actually, it's a very subtle element of understanding the, the question in terms of what's the appropriate transition pathway or, or development pathway for energy today that's very different than it was 15 or 20 years ago. So 15 or 20 years ago, there was an economic development paradigm that said, you had to go from agriculture to manufacturing to services. You had to in, invest in power, roads, and infrastructure in order to get there. That's now being kind of questioned, I would say, a little bit in terms of are there other opportunities to be more heterogeneous in terms of the economic development pathway. I think there's a very parallel track for energy and power, which is the, you, one does not have to follow a paradigm which was essentially developed in the early 1900s, which was centralized generation, transmission, distribution, and a holistic monopoly. And there could be, in fact, very healthy and clean economic uh, development and power and energy development, which is heterogeneous. 
It could be promoted to have competition within the industry. It could be based upon services. It could be based upon the ability of even a, uh, a, a national utility company having the authority to actually sell and service distributed generation technologies or be in competition for that. And so again, it's a very different, I mean, if one actually steps back academically and looks at it, there is an ac there's an academic paradigm that can be applied that says, okay, we can move from, I call it a centralized approach to a heterogeneous or necessarily, not necessarily a decentralized approach, but a deep, but a heterogeneous approach to it. And so those are the elements that we've articulated in terms of, I call it, ease of transition pathways. Uh, but I think that to the latter point, I think it's a really important conversation, not only in, in the small room, but I think within the larger audience here, that is to talk about how do clean energy transition pathways support new paradigms for economic growth. Uh, I think even just the starting story of distributed generation offering the ability for for gender, for education, for small medium, for, for small enterprise, for clean water, for clean cooking. Those are the elements at the bottom end of that economic paradigm, which are really critical in order to get to the critical mass that then go into uh, much greater economic development in terms of services and small and medium enterprises. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to add, uh, uh, there was a a question on green ID. I want to add uh, one point for the class uh, story. Uh, the green ID has assists, for example, a pig farm with 5,000 5, pigs. It was uh, in the past quite difficult how to treat with the mass of the pigs. But uh, now uh, they use uh, biotechnology produce methane gas, and the pig farm is self-sufficient in energy, reduce a lot of costs, and uh, it's one of the points. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and, and uh, uh, the green ID is uh, uh, supporting the very much to install uh, renewable energy in ethnic minority group in remote area, in mountainous uh, region, like in the border uh, province in the north, but very much in central highland of uh, Vietnam. And by that way, uh, it's not only a problem of uh, renewable energy, it's a problem of uh, creating uh, energy supply for decentralized uh, a unit for farmer, for isolated uh, family, for remote area. And it uh, really uh, brings some kind of miracle for this uh, family. Uh, I want to end here. Um, maybe we have uh, still five minutes uh, or uh, four minutes. Uh, maybe one uh, more question, please. Um, so I was just wondering that um, these are more um, uh, the scenario building, the vision that is possible, right? So this is more research. And then if I look at the government action, so the national action, then how do you see to bridge the gap? Because the national uh, concerns are more whether to destabilize the current current um, current system and to is it going to be more experimental or is it going to really deliver the goals in terms of electricity generation and the mix change right so uh, so there is a kind of um, practical um, practical doubt whether this will be possible or this is going to be experimental, whether this is going to destabilize the situation. So how do you address this uh, issue? Hi, I have a question about 
um, the role of nuclear power. So we've seen a lot of data about the growing potential of renewable energy, but there are some arguments that say that it's not happening fast enough and we need nuclear power in order to get away from fossil fuels. And I was wondering what you think about that debate. Okay, I'll, I'll start very quickly. Um, so to the latter point, um, what uh, I tried to articulate in my slides is that renewables grow at about um, 100, 120 gigawatts per year. Um, that's more in each year than all nuclear that will be built in the next 20 years, which is on, in the pipeline about 60 gigawatts, if it's all realized, only in 20 years. So this, this is a very uh, ill-informed myth uh, that nuclear uh, is, uh, is much bigger and much faster and much larger than renewables. Renewables uh, are outpace it uh, 150-fold every year. Uh, but it's not to say that nuclear cannot be part of the solution. It will depend upon the economics and the politics, frankly, in every country, because not all countries are so well endowed. Um, let me do, just do very briefly on, on, on your point on this transitional element. Um, you're asking a very complex political economy question, which is um, partly addressed through, uh, I call it a suite of of information, and at least from our perspectives, that suite of information involves a bit of others have done this, so how can I learn from them? That was the example of all these other countries. A bit of show me that it actually will work here, uh, because I always are, am very articulate that no policymaker will, well, no smart policymaker will necessarily put an ambitious goal out if their Ministry of Power or Utility tell them that that's uh, unrealizable. Um, and so you have to work the technical aspects of that in order to give the confidence side. And then the other element is really the finance and economics part of it, which goes back to these transition pathways. And that has an inside stakeholder game, but also a very large external stakeholder game, the NGO community, the consumers, the large industries, and others. And it's not a simple dynamic to play with, uh, but there are enough examples now of this actually working throughout the world uh, that one can at least bring some stories to tell uh, with recognizing that the answer will always be, well, that's not here, and so I have to learn it myself. Uh, and so we have to go through it, but at least there's some lessons. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, the, our time is uh, over. Uh, may I ask you to thank all the three speakers with a big hand, and thank you very much for your active participation and attention. Thank you. <laughs>